I'm curious, but I shouldn't ask now. Do you have a <laughs> like a like a how do you say the diminished name like a Lusha? Lusha, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Russian speakers, that's usually what I go with. But when I speak in English, I use Alexei. So, yeah. All right, so welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math Physics seminar series. We are delighted to invite Professor Alexei Sherman from University of Minnesota. And he'll be speaking about his uh, recent work on exact lattice chiral symmetry. So he has done a lot of interesting work in uh, quantum field theory and also non perturbative aspects in lattice model and also continuum model. And today uh, we would like to, uh, you know, invite the audience also to interact, ask questions during the talk. So don't don't feel shy, just uh, ask questions during the talk. That's directly welcome, Alexi. Please, so yours, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ruben, for the opportunity to, to give this talk. I've been really looking forward to it. Um, uh, I, I want to start by by reiterating something you just said. Please don't hesitate to interrupt any of you with, with any questions you have. I'm happy to slow down, speed up, um, and, and, and so on as necessary and try to try to explain everything. So uh, indeed, I'll be talking about um, uh, a, a, you know, a, an exact lattice chiral symmetry in a particular class of models, which I hope that you find interesting. Uh, this is based on a very recent paper from about a, maybe a month and a half ago uh, with two spectacular collaborators, Evan Berkowitz, who is in Europe, uh, in ULIC, and uh, Theo Jacobson, who is currently at UCLA. Okay, so let me dive in. Um, so I think it might be a broad audience, so let me kind of start start gentle. Uh, so the first thing is that the lattice, uh, lattice quantum field theory is really useful. Uh, basically numerical Monte Carlo lattice simulations on space-time lattices are one of very few tools that allow systematic studies of a really broad class of strongly coupled quantum field theories, in particular, including QCD. It's one of our most powerful available tools for studying non-perturbative questions in a quantitative way from first principles, basically. Um, and uh, so it is uh, our best current tool for studying confinement, I think I would say, and uh, an enormous amount of effort over roughly the last 50 years, maybe, or yeah, maybe 40 years, um, both in developing better computers, but actually even more importantly, in developing better algorithms, better way of thinking about things, has led to an avalanche of really exciting QCD results that connect to experiment and so on over the last few years. So people have really began to squeeze information uh, about QCD out of these lattice approaches with real world applications in the last few years. It's very exciting. Um, but as with any powerful tool, there are always challenges. Uh, and one basic thing that whenever you construct some discretization of a quantum field theory, and then you want to work with it, um, one thing that you always want to try to do, if you can, is preserve as much of the symmetry of your target continuum theory as possible. Um, the reason for this is probably pretty obvious. Uh, basically, if you don't preserve, for example, all of the internal symmetries, um, then as you take the continuum limit, uh, you are in danger of potentially getting the wrong results because you will not describe the continuum limit that you thought you were hoping to describe if you have the wrong symmetries. Now, that might not be fatal. You might be able to fine tune somehow parameters of the lattice theory to get to the right continuum limit, or maybe you can't, uh, or it might be very hard to do in practice. Um, and trying to get this right is sometimes easy and sometimes not. It depends on the type of symmetry you're thinking about. And in QCD, um, as well as many other interesting quantum field theories, there's a major challenge here, which is that there are massless fermions around. And it's very hard to discretize massless fermions while preserving chiral symmetry, um, which I'll remind you of in, in, in a moment. Um, that poses some conceptual problems, because if you cannot preserve chiral symmetry on the lattice, you're going to have a hard time defining, for example, chiral gauge theories, where the gauge field couples to that chiral symmetry. Um, that's a problem because, for example, the standard model is chiral. Uh, so that's weird. It's hard to do that. Um, and it's also practically annoying because in QCD, like I said, there are light quarks. So to a good approximation, they're massless. And it's hard to get this 
symmetry that arises in that limit right on the lattice. Um, now, you might ask, why is it hard to preserve chiral symmetry? And there's a very old standard answer. Uh, it's basically because chiral symmetries are involved in anomalies. That's basically it. So let me remind you how that works just to set the notation, set the language. I suspect many of you know this better than I do, but let's just in case start easy. So let's take possibly the simplest example uh, that is relevant to the rest of the talk at least, which is a Dirac fermion in two space-time dimensions in the continuum. So here's the action. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, and this, uh, this fermion has two internal global symmetries. One of them is a U1 vector-like symmetry where you take this fermion field uh, psi and rotate it by a phase. And this is a Dirac fermion, so it has uh, left and right handed components. And the idea with the symmetry is you rotate both of the components with the same phase. But then you can also do a different type of U1 rotation called an axial rotation, where you rotate the left and right components with opposite phases. Okay? And that's represented in this line here. Gamma is what people often call gamma 5. It's this extra uh, Dirac matrix you can define in even space-time dimensions that anti-commutes with the other gamma matrices. And um, a famous thing uh, here is that this uh, free Dirac fermion um, and its symmetries, that, that there's, a, there's a mixed Tuft anomaly for, in this model. To see it, one of the things you could do is you could turn on a background field coupling to the U1V symmetry, to the vector-like symmetry. So that would mean that you take your Lagrangian, psi bar, gamma mu, d, psi, and add to it q times your background gauge field, capital A, and then the current associated with the symmetry, and then make q an integer. And um, then you discover that having done this, the, the other symmetry is not conserved. So the other currents are not conserved. So I'll, I'll reveal it in a second, but that, that's an Atwoft anomaly. Um, this Atwoft anomaly turns into what is often called an ABJ anomaly, the adler beldrick eve anomaly, if you make this gauge field, capital A, into a dynamical field, so you integrate over it in the path integral, then people usually rename it to little a. And in fact, in the rest of the talk, I will think about gauge theories where the gauge fields are dynamical, and so I'll actually have dynamical gauge fields, not background gauge fields for the most part. So let's review how the, the ABJ anomaly works. Um, so in particular, let's think about chiral symmetry in 2D QED with a direct fermion with charge Q, where the gauge field is dynamical. So then here's the Lagrangian. And well, we've turned on a, a gauge field that couples to the vector current. And so the axial current here is not actually conserved if you just calculate what it is, calculate this, uh, this thing. And what you get is you know, the, the, the charge of the fermion times something which is basically the field strength of the, um, of the U1 gauge field. And the way that it comes out, it, uh, what you really are getting is the topological charge density of the U1 gauge field in such a way that axial charge uh, is not conserved uh, in general, but it's conserved mod, mod 2q, basically. So this topological charge here integrates to an integer. Um, and so the violation of chiral charge is by 2q times, times an arbitrary integer. So that means that the ABJ anomaly reduces the axial symmetry to naively Z2q from what I've said so far. But in fact, the Z2 subgroup of U1A is actually coincides with uh, vector-like rotation, which is secretly basically minus one to the F in the way that it acts on the fermions. Um, and that's gauged dynamically. Um, and so the actual chiral symmetry, the faithfully acting chiral symmetry is actually just ZQ. So that's the anomaly free chiral symmetry in this model. Classically, naively, it's U1A, but quantum mechanically, it's only uh, ZQ. And here you can see why I'm talking about charge Q, Q, uh, char charge Q quantum electrodynamics in instead of um, charge one quantum electrodynamics. It make doing charge Q makes the story a little bit easier to say. I just want to confirm the Z2 uh -huh. that is model in the normal is the Fermion parity. Which is yeah, just... yeah, exactly. It's just fermion parity. The Z2 in the in the quotient is just minus one to that. It's just fermion parity, exactly. And that's gauged because because of because of how we've coupled to the dynamical U1 gauge. Yeah. Uh, sure. 
Now, it's hard to get this anomaly right on the lattice for many reasons. One of them is if you look back here, like to get the structure, it was important the topological charge be properly quantized. But on the lattice, topological quantities are often not quantized in any nice way um, because the lattice is kind of rough and it doesn't necessarily respect topology um, unless you are very careful in constructing the lattice action in the first place. And that's hard to do. Um, also more like at another level, um, in continuum quantum field theory, things like the ABJ anomaly arise from subtleties and regularizing one loop diagrams, basically. Um, but on the lattice, everything's already finite. So naively, there's not really any room for anything like an ABJ anomaly um, or any other type of anomaly for that matter. And indeed, naive attempts to stick massless fermions on the lattice uh, run into serious problems that are closely related to the, to, the, to, to the two points that I just mentioned. In particular, if you try to put fermions on the lattice in a naive way, you get something called fermion doubling, which I now want to remind you of. So the most obvious way to put a fermion, a, a massless fermion on the lattice is to take this term in the Lagrangian and replace the, con the continuum derivative operator with a finite difference operator. And then you have to be careful to do that in such a way that you preserve hermeticity, but th that's not very hard to do. This is, this is what you need to do. That's the simplest thing you can do at least. Um, so people tried this like at step one in the papers that were inventing lattice gauge theory by, by Wilson, uh, for example, like this is, he tried this and um, there's a problem. The problem is that you can go and calculate the propagator uh, both in the continuum and on the lattice we know what the result is in the continuum, but if you do it on the lattice, you find that your propagator has two to the d poles, where d is the number of space-time dimensions. And that means, physically, uh, that actually this thing on the right does not describe a single propagating massless fermion. It describes, in four dimensions, 16 propagating massless fermions. In two dimensions, it describes um, four of them. That's not what you want. Moreover, if you're careful and calculate the U1A charges, the axial charges of the doublers, they are such that the ABJ anomaly actually cancels from the between the contributions of these different uh, um, fermions for, from the slide discretization. And this is bad because, you know, starting on this side, we want one fermion in the continuum limit. And when we couple this to a gauge field, we want the ABJ anomaly. The ABJ anomaly is physical. You don't want to get rid of it. So the fact that this thing gets rid of it is bad. So um, of course, like I said, this was discovered in like the very first paper pretty much on the subject. Uh, so of course, a lot of QCD has been successful. So people have found ways around this. So let me remind you uh, of those ways. But before that, I need to remind you of, of a obstruction that any way around this has to deal with, okay? And that is the Nielsen and the Mia theorem. So here's a summary of what this theorem says. It says that it is not possible to construct a lattice Dirac operator, namely gamma mu d mu, that enjoys all of the following four properties. One is analyticity in the momentum when you go to momentum space. That is basically the assumption of locality, which is naively something you really wanna keep. Um, it naively would cause problems if you give up on locality. Um, then uh, for small p compared to the lattice spacing, you want the Dirac operator, you might want the Dirac operator to approach gamma mu p mu. That's certainly what happens in the continuum. Um, that's just a statement that as you take the continuum limit, you get a free fermion. And then the third thing is you, you want the Dirac operator to be inver uh, invertible everywhere except when p goes to zero. That would mean there are no doublers. And last, you want chiral symmetry. And chiral symmetry shows up in, in terms of the Dirac operator as a statement that the Dirac operator anti-commutes with gamma five or gamma as I'm calling it in this talk. So what the nielsen Nimir theorem says is these four things that you might think are something that you want, you can't have at all. That's what the theorem says. And so um, all of the approaches to this to date then give up on at least one of these seemingly natural requirements. Okay. So 
again, going back to basically the first paper on the subject, like more than 40 years ago by Wilson, one of the approaches is to just give up on this fourth thing. You add a term to the action that explicitly breaks chiral symmetry, the so-called Wilson term, um, but it also um, messes with the doublers. And then you also turn on the quark mass term, and then you fine tune, and you can make the doublers very heavy and keep one Fermi on light by fine tuning, and then you get the desired result at the cost of having had to do fine tuning and at the cost of having completely violated chiral symmetry at every intermediate step in the calculation. This, however, in practice is something that's often done in actual lattice simulations. It works, but it is perhaps not very aesthetically pleasing. And for some applications, this would not work at all, like for chiral gauge theory. Okay, another thing that is very popular and also goes back 40 or 50 years. Excuse me, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. sure. the, this part, uh, so I, I think, uh, can we say another way to say that the, the Wilson term or Wilson way to realize chiral symmetry actually makes the chiral symmetry not strictly local and on site? There's some exponential tail. Uh, so, so, no, that's another approach, which I'll mention in a second. That would be the overlap approach. In the Wilson approach, the chiral symmetry is just completely broken. It's just not there on, in the lattice theory at all. So not, not even reproduced when the latest constant is taken to zero? That's right. In general, it isn't. So basically, you, you introduce two terms that both break chiral symmetry explicitly. And you have to tune them against each other as you take the continuum limit, so that only in the continuum limit you, you get a chiral symmetry. But at any finite lattice spacing, there is no trace of chiral symmetry at all. So uh, the Wilson term that, that, that Wilson added is like a higher derivative term. It is naively non-normalizable. Well, it is non-normalizable. It, it's naively irrelevant, I think, is what I sh should have said. Uh, but it is actually, uh, it's dangerously irrelevant, so it can, it can do interesting things. Um, this is a very popular approach. There will be a disaster for any attempt to do chiral gauge theory, though, because you, know, mm -hmm. you, you really don't want to break uh, chiral symmetry if you're going to gauge it. So this, this is sort of a no-go. You can't even start here. Um, but in practice, when people do QCD, this is how they often do it. Um, but just make sure, so did, did, did you uh, still be able to reproduce chiral symmetry in this Wilson approach in any limit? Just make In sure. any D? Yes, it works in, in any, any in, So in any limit? Just in so. any limit. How in, do you mean? In any, in any dimension. But, but you, you, sorry, I, I saw that you answered me that say chiral symmetry is it's basically broken and it's not restored in any way. I just it's, really... it's restored only in the continuum limit mm -hmm. by fine tuning, moreover. You have to fine tune to get it. So if you don't fine tune, you don't even get chiral symmetry in the continuum limit. So, how is this fine tuning done? Just like you have a. Numerically, numerically. So, you pick some correlation function where you can see where you know it should do something nice in the, in the chiral limit, and you scan lattice parameters until this thing does what you want. But of course, what you, you know, this is. I mean, you can do it. It's, it's not, not very, arguably not very elegant, but you can do it, and people do. And, and this fine tuning needs to be done at the large size system, and also exactly, exactly, constant taking exactly. relatively small compared to system size. Exactly, exactly. Now, like I said, people have thought about this for forty years, so they have fairly efficient ways of doing it by now uh, in practice. But um, so, people like this is considered one of the cheaper ways of implementing. But, but this approach, does the chiral symmetry need to be anomaly free in order to do this fine tuning? No, it does not. No, it doesn't have to be anomaly free. Right. Yeah. Which means that you can also realize that chiral symmetry that is anomalous and not even gaugeable, but you can still realize this. In principle, yes, I think. But I think nobody has made a serious attempt to make this work for like chiral gauge theories, like I said, because they're violating the symmetry of finite lattice spacing just seems like a very bad first step. Yeah. Um, right. Sure. So another popular approach are staggered fermions, which are sometimes called Kogut-Saskin fermions. And they have other names. Other people have been involved in their development, of course. Um, with Kogut-Saskin fermions, you get um, three of the things that you want, but not this, this one involving doublers. So in the Kogut-Saskin approach, you reduce the number of doublers from 2 to the d to a smaller number. But that number is not 1 unless the space-time dimension is 1. 
So you still have doublers. Now, how much of a problem this is that depends on what your target theory is, what you want to actually study. Uh, but it doesn't give you exactly what you want still. Um, right. So that's staggered fermions. They're nice, uh, very interesting. In some cases, they solve the problem. But then you need to get lucky and have the target theory have exactly the right number of physical fermions so that the, the, the extra doubled fermions coming from the staggered formulation are sort of can be interpreted as being physical. That's, yeah. um, that sometimes happens, but it's certainly not generic. Um, and then finally, the you know a particularly elegant approach that I think uh, is quite popular at the conceptual level and less popular at the practical level because it's numerically expensive is um, something called overlap fermions or sometimes called domain wall fermions. They're very closely related to each other. Um, and there you give up on two of these things in a mild way. So the Dirac operator becomes non-local at any finite lattice spacing. And chiral transformations also don't act in a local way. It's not like you, you, you know, the, the chiral symmetry doesn't act the way it does in the continuum at all. It acts in some weird non-local way with some exponential tails. Um, but it, as you take the continuum limit, everything becomes local. And at any finite lattice spacing, you have this non-local version of chiral symmetry that's good enough to prevent things like additive mass normalization. And um, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty good way of, of getting um, chiral symmetry on the lattice. And in fact, um, it's widely believed that it's basically the best you can do in a wide class of, of models, this overlap approach. But like I said, it's quite numerically expensive to implement this. So in practice, it's not used as often as the other approaches I just mentioned. So let me sort of finish this part of the talk by summarizing what the state of the art um, was more or less on the subject uh, around you know, 10 years ago. Um, uh, in a really nice review article on uh, lattice gauge theory and chiral symmetry um, by, by David Kaplan. So the statement there was that um, you should, you know, a lattice theory will not correctly reproduce anomalous symmetry currents uh, that you would want in the continuum limit unless you actually break the symmetry explicitly by the lattice regulator. That's what some of the regulators that I mentioned do. Um, and that means that it would be foolish to attempt to construct a lattice theory with an exact chiral symmetry. This is a statement that I think everybody would have made in 2009. I'm not trying to pick on David Kaplan here. Um, at the time, that it was a completely reasonable statement. Um, but foolishness can be time dependent. And the point of this talk is that recent HEPTH developments actually allow a way forward. Um, to explain basically why, um, I should mention that there are a few quite popular myths in the HEPTH, PH, LAT communities, and some related myths in the CONMAT community, but since I'm not from that community, I better, better not try to summarize them. But the high energy version of these myths related to chiral symmetries and anomalies are that first, only fermions have anomalies. This is what the impression that you would get if you look at a popular textbook on QFT, like Beskin and Schroeder, for example, uh, which to be fair is, is uh, you know, we're like 30 years old now, so. Uh, but anyway, uh, also anomalies in at least textbook treatments all fall out of subtleties of the regular dependence, as I said earlier. And if this is your view, um, then you're kind of led to this pessimistic conclusion that I mentioned here. Um, but it turns out that these, these myths are actually wrong. Uh, and this has been, depending on the little sub-community that's been clear for a long time, it's become much better appreciated in the last several years. For example, purely bosonic systems can have anomalies. Um, also, anomalies can appear, uh, 12 anomalies, for example, uh, in systems with just a finite number of degrees of freedom. Um, there are many condensed matter antecedents uh, on that. I have not nearly listed all of them. There are uh, some in the high energy literature. I happen to have listed only the ones that are along the direction that I'm going to pursue, but there are others, including by, by our host Juven in a variety of recent uh, interesting work. So I'm um, not saying that the thing on the slide is supposed to be particularly new to people in this audience, but you know, if you go to a typical <laughs> uh, high energy theory audience, uh, perhaps these statements might be somewhat surprising if your view is based on textbooks. So what's our approach? 
Well, the first thing to say is that people don't actually put fermions when they work with digital computers, as we usually do. We don't yet have quantum computers in any practical sense. What people do is they first integrate out the fermions on paper. They get some fermion determinant, or perhaps a product of fermion determinants, or perhaps a fafian, but whatever. And then they put that on the computer. Because now you have a, basically your functional digital measure is built out of purely bosonic objects, and that, that's something you can put in a digital computer. So the question that we're motivated by is, could it be possible to discretize the determinant directly instead of discretizing the Dirac operator itself. The point is that the Nielsen and Mie theorem constrains the Dirac operator. And then indirectly for the class of Dirac operators it discusses, it constrains the determinant. But it doesn't directly constrain the determinant. That's not what the theorem is about. It's about D, not that D. So, okay, that, it might not be obvious how you could possibly discretize the determinant directly, but hold that thought. The, the idea now is that any new way of, around the nielsen nimier theorem would be interesting. I basically told you the three ways that people have. Um, there are not so many others. So any new way is interesting. And so why don't we try in two dimensions? That's like the first non-trivial case for quantum field theory. So let's try. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Oh, go should... ahead. Uh, oh dear, when you uh, quote the uh... Kaplan's uh, review, you say his statement that you will be foolish to expect constructivity theory with the uh, exact curl symmetry, maybe two yes. slides back, right? Uh -huh. you, you can go by that one, so I guess audience can see that. So is that statement still holds for more restrict curl symmetry that is anomaly-free, in your opinion? Just make sure, because I don't think that's, it's um, in my opinion, it's just, it's, it's, it's actually doable for Anomaly free carosymmetry. It's not doable for anomaly it's doable. free. It's doable. It's doable. Ah, yeah. well, uh, if a chiral symmetry yeah. has no anomaly, is not involved in anomalies in any sense, no ABJ anomalies, no Tooth anomalies, then yeah, it probably is doable. Um, the, 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 the perspective here was it was focused on uh, film theories like QCD, where the chiral symmetry is definitely involved in anomalies, and then, then you have problems. I right. do think that if there's no anomalies whatsoever, then you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, but but my, uh, at least from my point of view, I'll make a claim, say that at least the way and the work or other people related to my work understanding is that for a uh, chiral symmetry that is being anomaly free, then you can actually realize this chiral symmetry exactly and and locally yeah. on on a right. site. Right. Right. Good. Good. So connected with that, I can make mm -hmm. a comment. Uh, maybe. That's exactly what happens with here. So if you put this action, the U1A symmetry ends up being completely anomaly free because of the chiral charges of the doublers. Yes. By and any... not, co not coincidentally, you can realize it, it acts locally, it acts on site, everything is nice. The problem is that now you're working with the theory that is not the target theory that people wanted for the applications they had in mind. For other applications, it might be good enough. And yes. it, now it depends on what application you have in mind. So, uh, so you are saying that we can have in multiple fermions with certain U1 charge such that the U1A anomaly or U1 chiral symmetry anomaly is canceled. For example, like one plus one D, three, four, yeah. five, zero model. Ah, that's not enough. That, that one is very of anomalies. Uh, yeah, then you then I say that you can break other symmetry that has two anomaly. Just realize those one that doesn't have two anomaly. Yeah, yeah. So so here there's no anomalies at all. There's no not even a two anomalies. So you see, I, even having a two anomalies is make, makes life difficult potentially. So at least I think, but uh, at least I think so. Um, but let's perhaps return to that soon. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, maybe this this will be helpful for. Later, so I guess when you say chiral symmetry, maybe we can distinguish a bit, say whether you want to realize chiral symmetry uh, that has anomaly, mm -hmm. more generically, or oh, anomaly free chiral symmetry. Right, 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 right. Because that two cases is kind of different. That's right, that's right, that's right. So let's let's look at examples and it'll be easier than trying to make right. completely well, generic. Well, in the case of QCD, we know those chiral symmetry does have the- Exactly, exactly. Anomaly. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but but for the the chiral gauge theory, that chiral symmetry actually we want it, it the chiral symmetry to be anomaly free, 
and we want that to be gauged as a right. But nevertheless, there are often the twelfth anomalies around, and that poses its own subtleties. And even defining the chiral symmetry can be subtle. Uh -huh. I, I, I make no claim that our approach is the only approach. There, there are other approaches that are very interesting. But, 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 but my point is that even though there's a chiral symmetry in a larger sense, might have a anomaly within this larger group, but you can still find anomaly free subgroup of chiral symmetry. And that's yes. the one you sh one should distinguish from those anomaly free chiral symmetry yes. subgroup. That's fair. That's just a larger one. For the 3450, that 3450, like U1, one of the U1 or two of the U1 is, can be anomaly free and mutual anomaly free. Yes. The multiple other two U1 outside this, this two U1 has a mixed anomaly. To whom mm -hmm. this one, so we can separate them and discuss the situation differently. Then I think will be very transparent to the audience. But that's, perhaps, that's perhaps, my point. Perhaps. thank you. Perhaps, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. So um, the idea uh, of of our approach, um, at least the first version of it that I'll tell you about today, is start in two dimensions, uh, two space time dimensions. And in two space time dimensions, you can try to take advantage of bosonization. So bosonization for a Dirac fermion in two dimensions is the statement that the Dirac op uh, sorry, the determinant of the Dirac operator can be written as a path integral over an extra field, which is a compact scalar, this one, with the following action. M is the mass term, A is the U1 gauge field that I had floating around because ultimately I want a coupling to to, to a dynamical U1 gauge field, and there's a typo. Uh, earlier, I had Q everywhere. This was supposed to be Q as well, this N parameter. And mu is some normalization scale. Now, I should say, technically, a 2D compact boson is dual to a 2D direct fermion with gauge fermion number, not quite to a 2D direct fermion. However, for us, my fermion number is anyway gauged. So that's fine, not an issue. So instead of trying to discretize this thing, the Dirac operator, and then calculate the determinant, which is the usual approach in lattice gauge theory in space-time, um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to discretize this thing directly, which amounts to discretizing the determinant without first trying to discretize d. Just, just discretize the determinant using this identity. So let's see. Um, in the bosonized representation of the Dirac, sorry, of the determinant of the Dirac operator, the chiral symmetry acts by shifts on this compact boson. And uh, the Fermion mass operator, psi bar L, psi right, maps to e to the i phi. So this thing is supposed to rotate under chiral symmetry, and this thing rotates under chiral symmetry as well. So that, that, that's, how, that's how U1A, the U1A classical symmetry is supposed to act. The, the way that the vector-like transformations act is, is kind of weirder, and I'll say it more precisely later. Uh, the reason it's weirder is that the vector current um, has to find the current for the, for the scale. Um, so we'll, we'll deal with that soon, okay? But now the goal is the following. We want to write down a lattice action for 2D. Somebody has their microphone on. Maybe you want to turn it off. I think it's by accident. So. Um, so you want to write down a lattice action for 2D QED, where um, only chiral transformations that um, that act by sort of discrete a discrete set of angles are symmetries, and the rest aren't. That would be the ABG and Okay. 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 And before continuing, I want to emphasize that just because we've written the, the, the determinant in terms of a boson, it doesn't mean that we've solved the problem. Now, you might think you've heard of fermion doubling problems and difficulties with chiral fermions. You've never probably heard of a boson doubling problem. But the problem is not solved just because we've introduced a new variable, at least not in any particularly trivial way. Um, one, one way to see that there's going to be subtleties is um, the vector current, as I said a minute ago, maps to the winding current for the scalar. But you know, winding is a topological thing in the continuum. On the lattice, like I said before, can, you know, can, topological things are often not quantized properly. So that's going to be a potential problem. Um, and uh, the reason this is a major issue is if you think about the coupling to the gauge field, which is where all the life in the theory comes from, um, you can massage it. And uh, you know it looks like an axion coupling, uh, so it's a coupling of a scalar to the topological charge density. Um, so again, that is a very topological-looking thing. 
it's not totally obvious you can get that right on the lattice. At least it wouldn't have been if I was giving the stock five years ago. But I'm not, I'm giving it in 2023. So I can take advantage of, or we, we, we took advantage of a variety of interesting developments in the literature to, to actually do, do this. So now, now, now the really lattice thing begins. So I need to tell you what kind of lattice I'm gonna use and introduce some language for talking about it. So we're gonna work on a square space-time lattice with periodic boundary conditions. So it's a torus. Um, we, uh, we call the sites S, the links L, plaquettes P, and um, it's gonna also be important to talk about the dual lattice and the corresponding quantities in the dual lattice will have a tilde on them. So S tilde, L tilde, P tilde. And there's a Hodge star operation that takes you from the lattice to the dual lattice and vice versa. Finally, it's useful to introduce lattice differential forms. Um, so, uh, you know, you can define a notion of a covariant, sorry, an exterior derivative on the lattice um, like that. Uh, and uh, it, it satisfies the same basic identities in the, in the continuum. So for example, D squared is zero for an exterior derivative in the continuum. It's also true for this lattice exterior derivative. Okay, the reason I want this technology is that I'm gonna to wanna to try to get topology right and then introducing uh, things like differential forms and exterior derivatives and so on and um, will, will help us get the topology right. So here's a picture of our lattice. The black, cur black lines are the original lattice. Uh, here's a site, here's a link, here's a dual link, here's a plaquette, and here's a dual site, which is dual to the plaquette under the Hodge star operation. Okay. So the VLAN idea is very old. By the way, uh, so go ahead. Uh -huh. Doing Euclidean time, Euclidean space, Euclidean lattice here. Yes, Euclidean lattice. Everything is Euclidean, the standard setting for space time lattice gauge theory. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and we have an appendix in our paper where we reconstruct the Hamiltonian version of our story, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it during the talk. Yeah. Okay. And extract, extract the using the Euclidean passing the goal, maybe extract correlation function out of here, you can still convert some way to the like more like Lorentz. Yeah, in the same way, in the same way as people do for lattice QCD, okay. so, right? So people, it's not quite well. well um, Euclidean lattice Monte Carlo calculations cannot give you all things you might be interested in. So there are some things that are sort of intrinsically real time um, that are very very hard to get. Uh, but there's a very wide class of things that you can get uh, out of Euclidean lattice field theory calculations, and those are the ones that I'm going to target uh, with this approach. Yeah. Like a two-point function correlation. Two-point functions, three-point function. You can get binding energies of things. You can get mass spectra. Um, scattering. Mm -hmm. You might think scattering is real time, but um, you you can get a, get, get information about scattering amplitudes out of lattice QCD. Um, yeah, that's right. Not everything, but you can get a lot. Also, like instanton density. Yeah, yeah. You can get things about instantons. Yeah, you can get a lot, but not everything. Um, yeah, some things are very hard using this kind of approach, but many things are doable. Thanks. Uh -huh, yeah. So good. So the, the kind of lattice technology I'm going to use is called uh, the VLAN discretization, basically. Uh, more precisely, I'll use a modern upgrade of the old VLAN idea. So the VLAN idea dates back to the 70s. I want to start by explaining it. So let's do it for a compact scalar. So I have a compact scalar in a continuum. And Velan's idea is to represent it by a pair of fields on the lattice. One of those fields lives on sites. That's the most obvious way to trans transcribe a you know, scalar to the lattice. But in Velan's construction, this thing that lives on sites is real valued. It's not compact. But then what you want to do is you want to gauge shifts by 2 pi so that you effectively make it compact. And to do that, you introduce a discrete gauge field, which lives on links, which I'm going to call n. Okay, And that, that thing is going to be integer value. And this gauging process, uh, is, well, the gauge transformations are written out here. So your gauging shifts by 2 pi is an integer. If you simultaneously transform this discrete gauge field with the same gauge parameter with the right coefficient, 
uh, you will end up getting something that describes a compact scalar boson. Um, and for example, like gauge invariant derivatives, here gauge invariant under this discrete shift gauge redundancy, uh, look like that. So this is the continuum thing. This is the lattice version. It's invariant under these transformations. Um, you can do the same thing for gauge fields. Villan did this for, for, uh, this, for, for gauge fields. So in particular for abelian gauge fields. Uh, I don't think there's a particularly nice version of this for non-abelian gauge fields, at least I don't know of one. Um, so uh, the continuum you want gauge field a mu on the lattice is replaced by a real valued field a that lives on links and a integer valued thing that lives on plaquettes. And the idea is, again, you want to gauge discrete shifts of, of, the, of, of A. Um, and uh, this R field, which is living on plaquettes, is also going to transform in an appropriate way. Um, and of course, you all, in addition to this, you know, discrete shifts, which are like large gauge transformations, you also have local gauge transformations uh, with a gauge parameter H, which lives on sites. So uh, here are the gauge redundancies of this package of two fields, A and R, which together describe a U on gauge field on the lattice. And for example, F mu nu at a point on the lattice becomes DA at a pocket minus two pi times RP. This thing together is gauge invariant under the, the full gauge symmetry, both discrete and continuous. To this, yeah. So uh, what's the value of this approach? Well, for example, um, the winding of the scalar field is now naturally quantized on the lattice. So remember that, you know, what, 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 what's the winding number? The winding number is the integral of basically d phi on some curve. Well, the lattice version of d phi is this thing. So if you sum it over some closed curve, that's the integral, and normalize it reasonably, then this part identically vanishes in the sum because phi is real. So it, in particular, it's not compact. So it's single valued. So by Stokes theorem, you just get zero on a closed curve. And the only thing that contributes is this n, but the n's are integers. So their sum is an integer. So winding number is an integer. Similarly, instanton number by the same idea uh, on any closed manifold, uh, is an integer. So that's nice. Uh, it gives us a chance to get things right. There's a little bit more work to really get everything right, but this, this gives us a chance. Okay, this is a lattice approach that can preserve topological quantities and hence gives you a chance to talk about a broad class of theories with anomalies. Certainly not all. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the, the gauge field on the lattice, on the original lattice, okay? But it turns out it, it's really convenient to put this, the compact scalar that we had in the continuum on the dual lattice. So you'll see why in a second, okay? But so here is part of the action, not all of it. I'm gonna write the rest of it in a moment. So here is the, the, the compact boson. It's living on the dual lattice. It has some parameter kappa, which I'll talk about soon. It's some just thing you have to choose on the lattice to get the right continuum limit. And then there is the gauge field, field strength squared, with some prefactor, which is basically one over the, the gauge coupling squared. Um, and then there's one more thing that I need to now explain. Um, so here, there's an extra field that I've just introduced called chi. Chi lives on sites. This is the only place that it appears in the action. And so it's a Lagrange multiplier. If you integrate over chi, you get a constraint that dn is zero. So the field strength of this discrete gauge field is zero. It turns out that means that there are no dynamical vortices in the model. And so there's a U1 vector symmetry in this sector of the theory. And the fact that there is this U1 vector symmetry in this subsector uh, means that we, we, it's meaningful to try to couple this to a U1 gauge field. 
So um, in particular, the U1V symmetry acts by shifts on this Lagrange multiplier field, and the classical U1A symmetry acts by shifts on the field phi. Okay. Um, and this, this technique, this, this idea, this, this came from work by um, Gottringer and uh, Sullivan Passage, and then other uh, wonderful work by um, um, Lem, Shao, Cyber, Gorantla, and uh, many others in recent years. This is called the modified VLAN approach. So uh, to give a picture of where the different fields in our model lie, here's where the, the gauge field lives. So it's on links and plaquettes of the original lattice. And then the continuum compact boson is now represented by three lattice fields, uh, which, which are sort of spread out among the lattice and dual lattice. And the approach of spreading fields around on the lattice and the dual lattice is reminiscent of the strategy pursued in the staggered fermion construction. Uh, as you'll see, um, we get much better properties in, in the class of theories that we study than, than you would get with staggered fermions. But yeah, there's an eerie similarity to that. So that's worth thinking about. So I can finally write the full action for 2D charge Q, QED. So, so this stuff we already wrote, these three terms, and then you have two more. So this one couples the compact boson to the field strength of the gauge field. And then there is one extra term that I have to talk about in a, in a second. Um, but one of the things that's, that's being done here is that the field chi has electric charge Q because we want to get charge, charge Q, QED. Now, if you look at this action, the, the top line contains terms that are manifestly invariant under all of the gauge redundancies in our model and all of the symmetries. Um, the, the bottom three terms individually look very bad because they have, for example, there's, a, there's like a direct A that's just appearing by itself in this last term. And there's an N that's appearing by itself in this last term and so on. And chi now carries gauge charge, but it's also appearing sort of by itself. So this looks bad, but actually the coefficients are chosen in such a way that actually the whole thing together is invariant, is fully invariant under all of the gauge transformations. This is, this is a lattice version of a continuum story that was worked out in a paper around 20, in 2019 by Cordova, Fried, Lam, and, and Cyborg, where they discussed the fact that the standard axion coupling between a compact boson and a, gauge, a U1 gauge field is not treated correctly in most of the literature. And if you get it right, you basically get the continuum version of these, these three terms. Okay. So now we can collect our winnings, basically. So this is already enough to see that there's something super nice happening. Because the quantization of the topological charge on the lattice uh, in this model immediately implies that you only have an anomaly-free ZQ chiral symmetry instead of a U1 chiral symmetry. So imagine we do a shift of phi by 2 pi k over q. Uh, that doesn't do anything here. Obviously, it doesn't do anything there. doesn't do anything there. doesn't do anything there. So the only change is in this term. So here's the change in the action. And then if you collect terms and simplify, then uh, use the fact that our space-time is a closed manifold and the topological charge is quantized appropriately, you discover that the change in the action is 2 pi i times an integer, which means that in the path integral, it's nothing. So this is a symmetry. But if k was not an integer, this wouldn't have worked, and this would not have been a symmetry. So that's exactly what you want. This means zq is a symmetry, u1a is not. Uh, so we've just reproduced the ABJ anomaly on the lattice at finite lattice spacing. And chiral symmetry acts just as locally on the lattice as it does in the continuum, literally by a shift of a field that lives on sites. Okay. So, OK, and that's, this, this is possible because the global properties are correctly taken, tend to, taken into account, basically. Now, this model has an Atuft anomaly as well, and that's also reproduced at finite lattice spacing. Um, there's a ZQ electric one-form symmetry in this model that acts on Wilson lines by multiplying them by a phase. And the zero-form ZQ chiral symmetry and one-form ZQ um, um, one-form symmetry have a mixed of Tooft anomaly in the continuum theory because the generators of chiral symmetry are charged under the one-form symmetry and vice versa. 
So if you turn on a background gauge field, couple into one of the symmetries, you, you break the other. So how, is this, how does this appear on the lattice? Well, okay, here is the generator of chiral symmetry. So this is, you can show on the lattice that this is a topological operator. And uh, let's look at it. So what I've highlighted is that for this thing to be a topological operator, it's a line operator. And uh, along that line, there's a Wilson line. Okay. And so here's the Wilson line along the curve C. And this Wilson line is decorated by some stuff on the, on the links that it, that it that it pierces, uh, that involve phi. Now, these decorations are very important. They are the reason that this thing ends up acting on things to do with the compact boson. And so it's the reason that this thing is generating chiral symmetry. However, whatever it is, it is still a Wilson line. And therefore, it's acted on by the one form symmetry. And that means the generator of chiral symmetry, if you believe me that this is generator of chiral symmetry, is charged under the one form symmetry and therefore we see the total anomaly on the lattice at finite lattice spacing. And you can go through and check how this works for the generator of the one-form symmetry. It turns out that one, which is a local operator, is charged under chiral symmetry. So in this simplest example of a gauge theory in two dimensions with a massless fermion, we have successfully reproduced both the ABJ anomaly and all of its total anomalies for internal symmetries exactly at finite lattice spacing. And all of the symmetries act as locally on the lattice as they do in the continuum. So if you went back five years ago and you asked people if this is possible, I think they might have said no. Uh, and uh, the only reason we were able to succeed is by leveraging a series of wonderful papers by other people to, to do it. But they're all fairly recent. OK, now you could ask, is this useful? And you know, useful for like actual Monte Carlo calculations. And you might think that the answer is obviously no. There's like a giant fly in the soup. And that fly is that there's a bunch of eyes all over the action. So the action is not positive. This is bad because in Lattice Monte Carlo, you want the action to be, to be, to be, to be positive. Um, there's a naively horrible sign problem, which will prevent any kind of Monte Carlo calculation. But it turns out that this is a mirage. You can do a bunch of duality transformations in the lattice, which physically end up being equivalent to integrating out the, the gauge field in this particular case. And you get an equivalent action to what I wrote before. That's like exactly equivalent. We do like a bunch of identity transformations that like make things look different, but nothing is really changing physically. Um, that looks like this. So here phi is the same phi as we had before. Uh, there's some new fields, T and U, which appear through the dualization procedure. Um, and well, this new thing, again, has a term with an I in it, which I should have colored but didn't. OK, it's right here. So you might say that you didn't get rid of the sign problem. And that's sort of true, but not really. Because the point is that um, in this term, U only appears here, the field U. So if you do the integral over U, what this really does is it sets dt to be 0 mod Q. That's, that's what the role of this term is, in fact. That's all it does. So if you choose field proposals in your Monte Carlo simulation that respect the condition that the dt is 0 mod Q, then this term never contributes. It, it, it just doesn't contribute, provided that you respect the condition that it's trying to enforce. And then there's no sign problem. And it's easy to write down a, um, some, some algorithms that do that. People have done it before us for other applications. We adapted some of those ideas. Um, in the interest of time, maybe I won't talk about it. It's not very exciting. You just choose proposals in a reasonable way, and you don't have this problem. Now, the thing that I want to focus on more is the physics. So um, ultimately, we want to study the continuum limit. The continuum limit would be reached by working on an n by n lattice and taking n to infinity, among other things. Um, if you think about it a little bit, it turns out you need to hold beta over n squared fixed as you take the continuum limit. This has to do with the fact that beta is secretly 1 over e squared in lattice units. So, so just doing a little bit of scaling analysis shows you that's what you have to do to reach a nice continuum limit. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is if you're an aficionado of um, bosonization, then you might know that uh, you're supposed to get 
this kind of kinetic term for the scalar in the continuum limit um, with a one over eight pi in front. And here there's kappa over two. So naively you want to set kappa to one over four pi. But it turns out that in the lattice theory, in this lattice theory, kappa equals to one over four pi is not protected by any symmetries of the lattice model. So you expect it to get renormalized. So you'll need to tune kappa by a finite amount uh, to remove an effective Turing coupling that would appear if you don't tune it as you go to the continuum limit. Now, if that coupling appears, it doesn't change any like particularly substantive things about the theory, but it does change the numbers you would get. So you have to do a little bit of tuning to, to reach the desired continuum theory, but it's not a tuning that has anything to do with like getting the symmetries right. Uh, yeah. Maybe question, I, I'm not sure, maybe compare both the latest version or continuum version. Can you remind mm -hmm. me the value of those fields again, like are they in R, Z, N, and when you- Oh, good, 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 good. So phi, phi, phi is a real field, but it transforms into some discrete gauge tra transformations. So does T in such a way that this thing is gauge invariant. Then phi, again, it's, it's the same phi and T appearing in these two things. Um, and um, the, transform the gauge transformations, the discrete gauge transformations of phi and T are such that this is also gauge invariant. And same for this. Um, and uh, let's see. I think u is also an integer valued field, but it's arbitrary integer. Yeah. And uh, does it make a difference for the continuum version of the discrete latest version of this for the the value of the field here? Well, yeah. when you go to the continuum limit, so that's actually the the thing that I want to comment on in the very next slide. So in the in the continuum version of the theory. You know, you don't normally write things in the continuum with these discrete gauge transformations made manifest. Arguably, you should, but we don't. I mean, to do it in the continuum requires a lot of technology. You have to like cover space time with patches, introduce transition functions. It's a bit of a complicated thing. People don't usually do that. You could, and if you did, you would get very similar looking things actually. But but people don't usually do that. Anyway, to to comment on what you should get in the continuum is, is this slide. So what this lattice action is giving us, if you stare at it, is it's basically giving us a massive scalar field. So here's the kinetic term, d phi squared. Here's a mass term with some extra things to make sure everything is gauge invariant. But it's coupled to a BF theory, a ZQ BF theory. This is what this thing is. It's a ZQ BF theory by itself on the lattice. That's precisely the massive Schringer boson one, Schringer boson one expects from the continuum analysis of the charge Q massless QED. It's exactly what you want from the continuum. And then uh, chiral symmetry and the one from symmetry are both spontaneously broken in the continuum one. Okay. So you get exactly what you want from the continuum right on the lattice. So um, the next thing that I want to uh, talk about, and this will be like less detailed uh, because a lot, a lot of things are very similar, uh, is two flavor QED on the lattice, still in two dimensions. Um, so- um, Oh, by the way, just one more thing because you are going something even more, more complicated, right? So yes. the, the previous model, uh, do you also do the numerics? No, we didn't do numerics yet. We will, but we haven't yet. I see. We haven't yet. But the thing is that uh, one, one thing that's kind of uh, very satisfying here is that without doing the merits, you already see the Schringer boson and you already see all of the symmetry. So the numerics are guaranteed to give you the correct thing if, if you can do them. The place where you would need numerics and they would tell you something you cannot do on a piece of paper is when you introduce a mass term, then in general, the theory becomes strongly coupled. And then you would need numerics to really solve it. And um, we are hoping to do that in the relatively near future, uh, but we haven't yet. Um, other people have using other approaches, but we'd like to try to do it using this approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's let me let me mention a little bit about two flavor QED. I just uh, make sure if you do a numerics, is this approach more like a Monte Carlo type of things? Monte Carlo, exactly, just Monte Carlo. Okay. Lattice space time Monte Carlo, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
So to the uh, two flavor QED, okay? So I'm gonna call my two flavors to direct for me on Psi and Psi hat. Um, you could call them one and two, but for various reasons, it's just notationally easier to call them Psi and Psi hat for me. And then you follow the exact same approach as before. First, integrate them out on a piece of paper. You get some, de some determinants. Apply a billion personalization to those determinants. Then, um, discretize the resulting scalar field theory. And what you get is that. If you follow the same approach as I did before for one flavor QED. This looks like this looks longer, but it's literally just adding a second copy of things to what I said before, okay, with hats on it. Now, um, the reason I want to talk about this, even though this action is literally just a doubling of the previous action, is that you get something interesting when you start here and start trying to dualize it to try to get rid of the sign problem, because this thing definitely still has a sign problem. Um, so you get interesting things. So let me try to explain what they are. So after working a little bit, okay, conceptually, it's the same as before. You're just integrating out the gauge field, taking into account global structure carefully. Uh, that's at a technical level, slightly harder than before, but you can just do it. Um, you get this thing. Okay, so here we have um, you know, rewritten things in terms of new, new fields that are linear combinations of old fields. So for example, eta is the linear combination of phi and phi hat, and phi and phi hat are dual to psi bar left, psi right for one of the fermions, and psi bar left, psi right for the other fermion, for example. And sigma is chi minus chi hat. Chi are these funny Lagrange multiplier things that um, are related to the vector currents in some, in some way. Anyway, um, the thing about this that's kind of interesting is the following. Um, first of all, okay, there's still a couple of terms with i's in them. I'll talk about that shortly. But before going there, we notice something interesting. If you set kappa to one over four pi, which is what you should do if you just naively look at what the continuum limit should be, okay, that's the thing that I said is not a good idea uh, in one in the one flavor case because it's not protected by any symmetry. If you do it here, what you discover is that the top line in blue becomes a self-dual lattice scalar. It's self-dual under Poisson resummation, um, basically. That is the lattice version of T-duality. And that means that there is an extra symmetry on the lattice when kappa is set to 1 over 4 pi. So that point is protected by a symmetry of the lattice theory. That symmetry can be thought of as coming from a topological line operator that's defined by doing T-duality within a disk or on half of space, depending on how I want to think about it. Um, this, this, this topological line operator squares to a lattice translation, but it's a, yeah, it's a topological line operator, so it's a symmetry. And it protects this point in parameter space. So that's one thing that's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that this top line is decoupled from the bottom lines. If you look at the top line, it has two U1 symmetries that have a mix of Tooft anomaly on the lattice. Well, in two dimensions, the only way you're gonna match that is by a conformal field theory in the continuum limit. So that means the top line must flow to a C equals one compact boson at the self-dual radius, moreover, in the continuum limit. It flows to one of the self-dual radius because of the thing that I said a minute ago. When you choose kappa correctly, it will stay there. That's the self-dual radius. And then the bottom line is a decoupled massive Schrader boson that transforms under some discrete symmetry. And if you compare it to the expectations that people have for two flavor QED, this is exactly what should happen according to an old paper by Kutasov and Schwimmer. Okay. So um, the top line in the continuum limit has the full non-abelian chiral symmetry of the continuum model. That's the sequence one self-dual boson as the SC2 times SC2 symmetry. The bottom carries the discrete symmetry, the ZQ chiral symmetry and the ZQ one form symmetry. So that's very pleasing. Again, working right on the lattice, you nail the continuum expectations for this without having to do any lattice calculations. You just see what you're supposed to see at the massless point. Then you could add mass terms if you want and study the strongly coupled physics away from the massless point. 
Now, there are two imaginary terms, but just as before, their only role in life is to generate constraints. Basically, the constraint that, like, you know, du is zero. And um, let's see. Uh, dt is zero mod q. Those are the two constraints, OK? So it's easy enough to come up with um, field update algorithms in the Monte Carlo calculation that respect those constraints. And then those terms don't contribute at all. Uh, you can just drop them as long as your proposals respect the constraints. And then you can do Monte Carlo if you want without any assigned problems. So, so that's it for like vector-like 2D gauge theories, abelian gauge theories. It seems to work, as far as we can tell, for any vector-like 2D gauge theory. Uh, with abelian, abelian gauge theory, sorry. Um, we don't know how to do this for non-abelian gauge theories. So the last thing that I want to talk about during this talk um, is chiral gauge theory, a, a particular chiral gauge theory called the 3450 model, um, which has been studied, some, widely studied since the mid 80s. There have been uh, recent, uh, very interesting results in it by Juban and, and others in the last few years. Um, so this model um, has two left-handed while fermions with charge three and four, and two right-handed while fermions with charges five and zero. These charge assignments are chosen in such a way that the, um, you know, the the chiral anomaly cancels completely, and the gravitational Twift anomaly cancels completely if you couple to a dynamical gauge field. Um, now we can take these while fermions and package them into two direct fermions, psi and psi hat. Okay. But now the funny thing is that the direct fermions have both vector charges and axial charges, naturally. So your gauge field is going to need to couple in a vector-like way with charge 8 to one of the fermions and charge 4 in a vector-like way to the other fermion, but it also has axial charge. And the direct version of the anomaly cancellation condition is this one, and it's satisfied with these charge assignments, as you might have hoped. Now, chiral gauge theory is notoriously subtle. Uh, so you would not be surprised probably to hear that this was the most painful part of our paper to get this right. Um, it's much nastier than anything else that I've talked about so far. Um, and I'll try to sort of highlight the key points in, what I, in the results and not try to get bogged down in some details, which you can read about in the paper if you really want. So the, the thing that we're going to have to deal with um, that leads to a lot of the subtleties, is that we have one gauge field, which lives on the lattice. But it's going to need to couple to things that live on the lattice and also on the dual lattice, because we have both vector and axial charges. That's really awkward. So to make this work, we're going to introduce a function that's going to take us from, for example, sites in the dual lattice to sites on the uh, original lattice. Okay, so here's how the function is defined. And you'll see in a second how we use this function. Okay, it's going to allow us to couple the gauge field to the things it needs to couple to, but there's an immediate problem with even introducing this function, which is that it explicitly breaks Z4 lattice rotation symmetry. You can see that we've chosen a particular direction along which we go from the dual lattice to the original lattice and vice versa. So we've broken Z4 rotation symmetry by the, introducing this function if we make use of it in an action. So then you might be concerned that maybe we're going to have issues with Z4 rotation symmetry in our, in our 3450 discretization. Um, now, uh, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, even if there were such issues, which it turns out they're not, it would not be necessarily fatal. Uh, if we can get everything else right, then you can try to get rotation symmetry by tuning. Also, you have to carefully analyze whether there are, in fact, any relevant operators that break it, like even if it's absent, strictly speaking, if there are no, if, if there were to be no relevant operators that break it, be fine. But uh, we'll come back to this shortly. Okay, This is something to sort of keep at the back of your mind. So the action, I'll just admit, is kind of, Kind of hairy. Okay, so the first line is the gauge field, same as before. And then the second two lines contain the two scalars that represent the two Dirac fermions. Okay. And you see, now we're gauging the the, the shift symmetries with appropriate charges. So those are the axial symmetries. That's the QA and QA hat. Those are the two, you know, the, the two charges that we had here. And 
In doing that, we need the f function because you see, this field phi lives in a dual lattice. The original field, the gauge field A lives in the original lattice. If you want to write it inside this covariant derivative, you know, the index here needs to be, um, you know, you somehow need to get information about something, a link on the dual lattice and get it to, to the original lattice. That's where the function f comes in. And then there are the more easy to write couplings where you know, DA basically couples in an axion-like way to these phi fields. Well, that's where the vector charges come in. And then you need to write a bunch of other terms to make sure that this is actually genuinely gauge invariant. Under all of the symmetries, this, uh, the, all the gauge redundancy is discrete and continuous. So this may be a bit hairy, but it's just the thing that you would get if you follow your nose from what we started with back with the vector like gauge theories. And it passes all the consistency checks that we knew to do. So just as an example, the gauge variation of this thing okay, is this horrible thing. And the main thing to note about it is whatever horribleness it has, that, you know, I mean, in particular, I didn't write zero here. Like the gauge variation is not zero in general but it's proportional to QV times QA plus QV hat times QA hat. And this thing vanishes by, you know, for the charge assignments that we actually need physically, which are the charge assignments for the 3450 model. That's the anomaly cancellation condition. It, this, uh, this gauge variation cancels as it must precisely when the gauge anomaly cancels as it must for consistency. Um, now, here again, you might ask, okay, fine, you've written something that seems to work. Um, two issues. One, uh, there are a bunch of I's. So what are you going to do with this practically? And two, what about the Z4 rotation symmetry? Because like in the continuum, we have the full-blown Euclidean rotation, you know, SO2 or something. Uh, you know, you naively would need a Z4 subgroup of it at least to, to have the right continuum limit. And, you know, the, the way this thing is defined, this function F appears which breaks that symmetry, at least naively. So what are you going to do with it? Okay. And it turns out that looking for a sign problem free formulation gave us some interesting bonuses, yet again, just like in the two flavor vector-like case. Um, you try to, again, do some dualization procedure to try to take the complicated looking terms involving eyes to something simpler that you can just interpret as giving you a simple constraint that then you can solve in your field proposals. So that in practice, this some again conceptually just amounts to roughly speaking integrating out A and you know the, the gauge field, but it's now in the details are now much more complicated. Um, but after doing a little bit of work, um, you get the following dual representation of the action. Um, the, the you know the, uh, I'm going to highlight the parts of this you should care about. Okay, so first. There is a field phi, which is sort of rendered typographically a little bit different than before. It's some linear combination of the original phi and phi hat fields. And there's some field psi, which is some other linear combination of the original chi and chi hat fields. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of random numbers floating around in various places. There's some other fields that appear through the dualization procedure that, are, that transform under uh, discrete gauge transformation in such a way that this action is, again, fully gauge invariant, uh, pro provided that you use the 3450 charge assignments, which we've done already in this thing. So we already set QV, QV hat, QA, QA hat to their values relevant for the 3450 model. And if you look at this thing, um, several things become apparent. So first notice that the only terms with the I's in them are in the last line. And the first two terms, are actually just giving us constraints, okay? So the sigma dv term and the n dy term, these two, n hat dy term, they're just giving constraints. So for example, this term says that the dv is zero when you integrate out sigma. This one says that dy is zero mod two, something like that, okay? You can easily find Monte Carlo algorithms that respect those constraints, and then these terms never contribute. Next, um, another interesting thing is that if you stare at this term long enough, 
and if you're one of my collaborators, namely Theo, you'll notice that this is secretly a cup product of V and V, v with V. And then um, this particular cup product vanishes, provided that DV is zero. That's some identity involving cup products that you could derive. So that means that provided your Monte Carlo algorithm respects the constraints coming from these two terms, then first, these two terms don't even appear in your Monte Carlo in any explicit way, so you don't give a causal sign problem. And this last term, which also has an I, is identically zero. So it also doesn't contribute, you can just drop it. So you could do Monte Carlo with this, and we hope to in the future. But the next thing is that while the original lattice action did not have any kind of manifest zero rotation symmetry because of this funny f function we had to introduce, the dual action that we've derived does have that uh, discrete rotation symmetry. And that, since since to go from one to the other is a set of like just duality transformations that are exact, that means that the Z4 rotation symmetry was actually always there. It was just badly non-manifest in the original choice of variables, but it was secretly there. And it's made manifest in this particular dual representation. Um, so um, I'm gonna begin the conclusions, basically. So first, um, uh, we are hoping to do, to study some of these things using Monte Carlo calculations. Uh, and we are in the midst of um, developing and what we hope will be an easy to use, extensively documented, easy to modify and open sourced Python package to do Monte Carlo simulations of various modified VLAN models in two dimensions. So uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, if you keep an eye on the archive, you'll see a paper about this package, and it will go on GitHub, and you can use it and do whatever you want with it. Um, so that is work with uh, with these friends. I'm going to especially highlight two of them, uh, Evan Berkowitz and Seth uh, Busing. Um, Seth is a fantastic undergraduate um, at McAllister College who's been act very active in, in this. And Evan is a wonderful uh, lattice field theory expert without whom uh, we certainly would not have been able to produce such a uh, such, an, such an easy to use package. At least I hope it will be easy to use. Okay, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if, if you've wanted to do Monte Carlo calculations with this kind of technology, you'll be able to soon without having to write too much of your own code. Now, um, some of you may be wondering, okay, it's all two dimensional. The world is not two dimensional. Is there anything we can do in higher dimensions? Um, well, we haven't yet, but I think there is hope to go beyond two dimensions with this kind of approach. There are several ways you could try to do that. One idea is to try to use a dramatic progress in continuum bosonization in more than two dimensions since around 2015, where a bunch of people you know, wrote a lot of interesting papers about bosonization in three dimensions, for example. Um, now, in those bosonization, bosonization dualities in higher dimensions, um, trans Simons terms appear in a really vital way. Uh, and so to have any chance of making use of it, you would need a lattice formulation of trans Simons theory. That is not straightforward. However, there was a recent uh, very nice paper by Theo uh, Jacobson and Tim Suleman Fosic that basically I think solved the problem as far as I understand, at least for some subclass of tr trans Simons theories, which is good enough to get started. And so you, you, can, you can hope to pursue this direction. Hope. I'm not saying it's going to work. You have to do the work to see, but but there's a chance. So you might be able to just follow the same basic idea, bosonize the Dirac the determinant of the Dirac operator in three dimensions, then discretize that. That may be possible. And there are other approaches you could try to pursue that are kind of orthogonal to that, to generalize towards higher dimensions. So I've been talking for too long, so I want to summarize and then stop. Um, so since the earliest days of lattice field theory, um, finding Internal symmetry preserving discretizations of gauge theories with massless fermions has seemed out of reach whenever they were involved in any kind of anomalies, which is the typical case. Um, and in particular, there's a famous theorem, the nielsen yanomiya theorem, that seemed for decades to kill any hope of finding exact locally acting chiral symmetries on the lattice that were, you know, in ways that reproduce all kinds of anomalies. And in our work, uh, we explored an interesting way around this uh, theorem um, that preserves locally acting chiral symmetries on the lattice exactly, in contrast to previous approaches. 
Um, our approach, we think, is numerically cheap. Um, in particular, we think it should be vastly cheaper than overlap fermions. Um, and it even works for chiral gauge theories, as far as we can tell, at least for some chiral gauge theories, the 3450 model, for example. Um, I think there are now a huge number of things to do, both following up on our particular approach as well as in other approaches that are being developed um, to study, for example, chiral gauge theories. Um, we're trying a couple of extensions of all this uh, at the moment, uh, but please feel free to jump in. Like I said, we're going to make a publicly available code in case you want to do numerics with this soon. Um, yeah, there's a lot to do. So uh, I hope we can make some more progress. So thanks for listening. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, for right, the wonderful seminar, lecture. Uh, any question from the audience? Please feel free. Hi, uh, I have one. Uh, on page uh, 38, slide 38, I think, where you set like individual terms to zero. Bear with me, I'm gonna get there. Yeah. Um, so do you get something different if you instead set, you know, the linear combination of those two terms to zero and then doesn't that constrain like a different? A linear combination to zero. So I guess if you were to set a different linear combination of them to zero. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but here you're setting, you know, each red term equal to zero separately, right? Um. Sort of, but there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should try to say the reason for it. Yeah. Um, the if okay, uh -huh. this all went very fast, so it was hard to absorb. But if you stare at this action and look for places where the field phi appears, the only place it appears is here in this term. Mm -hmm. That means phi is a Lagrange multiplier, and you could integrate it out by hand. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a functional delta function from the continuum language and the lattice analog of it on the lattice, which is that du is equal to zero. That's so. Therefore, if you can do updates to your fields that respect the condition that du is zero, mm -hmm. and your starting field configuration has du equals zero, then this term will never contribute. That's what it means. And under those assumptions, you could set this term by itself to zero. And there's a similar set of remarks that apply to the other red term. Um, if you Again, if you stare at this action and look for u hat, the only place it appears is right there. Okay. And therefore, if you sum over u hat, you get a functional delta function that now sets dt to zero, but now mod q, as it turns out. Now, to understand that, you need to think about you know, where does the field u hat take values versus where does the field phi take values? Turns out phi takes values in the reals, u hat takes values in the integers. That's why the difference appears. But again, essentially, this is just a constraint. And if you can choose field update and a field update algorithm in your Monte Carlo calculation that respects that constraint, then this term will never contribute. And in, in that sense, you could set it to zero. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, yeah. yeah so I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of this uh, one plus one D carol gauge theory of a three, four, five, zero model, the approach, uh, the one I'm aware, of, the one I, I did with my collaborator is the one that uh, you might start with some finite width system with mm -hmm. one age with one plus one D chiral fermion with chiral symmetry charge of U1, three, four, five, zero. And there could be fermion doubling on the other age. So in some sense, it's more like a domain wall. Mm -hmm. And then you try to get rid of fermion doubling on the other side by symmetry mass generation. That's right. That's right. And gap, out the mirror, gap out the mirror sector. Yeah. And symmetry is on site and you can gauge it. And the finite width is just a small extra equal freedom that you can shrink so mm -hmm. you still get a one plus one d system right and in your approach you directly start with the one plus one d system yes and there are some uh anomaly evolving coefficient 
term that is canceled in this model. That's so, right. so that that uh, that directly, maybe you should. Uh, can you help to clarify a bit what exactly mm -hmm. that term that cancel imply and how is that imply? You 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 basically don't even don't even don't encounter Fermat doubling, right? Exactly. That's the point. That's the point. So. The, the, exactly right. So here, there's no doubling at all. Maybe maybe we can go back to that slide. I think uh, if I remember, it's around forty one or something. Y yeah. So the the, the I mean this is no, a little bit complicated. So the question of whether there is fermion doubling can already be studied in the simpler cases, the non-chiral cases. Maybe forty two, I think. Yeah, or forty two. Yeah, but so, right. right. Let me comment on this in just a second. But but I'm, I'm going to start with the the, the point that um, here there's really no doubling at all. Yeah. So in that sense, there isn't some other sector that you need to gap out. Yeah. Um. So yeah, but if, if you don't have any doubling at all, then it better be the case that the all of the anomalies. Um, all of the gauge anomalies cancel. There better not be any gauge anomalies. If there were, it would be inconsistent. And um, so here, that's exactly what happens. If you calculate the gauge variation with generic charge assignments, and you discover that you don't get zero. However, the, the non-zero thing is proportional to a particular combination of the charges, vector and axial charges, which is zero for the 3450 model for the actual chiral gauge theory of interest. And therefore, the gauge anomaly cancels. So you, you have uh, all of the, you know, all of the global symmetries of the model that you wanted are reproduced. I should also say one thing that I didn't, I mean, for you, especially as an expert, I probably should have said, um, what we did here is we, gave a discretization of the 3450 model with a gauged fermion number. So we we gauge, so you know the, the 3450 model has gauge invariant fermionic operators. Okay. So you are considered bosonic version of that. Bosonic, yeah, we, we, we passed the bosonic version of the model. So we gauge fermion number, some over spin structures, and then that's what we bosonize. We did that, to be honest, simply because we didn't want to deal with the orphan variant. Um, you know, one, one could probably deal with it. Uh, we just didn't, you know, we wanted to write the simplest thing we can and then start there. But uh, I suspect you could use this approach to also deal with the fermionic version of the theory if you did not gauge fermion, fermion parity. But that's not what we did. We, we gauged fermion parity first, studied the result. And of course, that's gauging a discrete symmetry. So the local physics has not changed at all. Uh, but very nice. But let me still ask a few more questions. So the sure. the, the 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 vector actual the Q or Q hat this combination is particular combination that you choose. Well, mm -hmm. you still want to keep gauging the U one three four five zero. Is that right? Exactly. So these Q Q you know these Qs are the integers that tell you how the gauge field couples to the the different wild fermions of the 3450 model. Right? right. So there are four fermions, four wild fermions. So there should be four different charges. Well, we package things into a sort of Dirac notation to make our life easier. And those are the four charges in the Dirac notation. And when you set them to the right values to get the 3450 model, this particular combination just happens to be zero. It's this thing. These are the charge assignments that correspond to the 3450 model, which, you know, this times that is minus 16, and this times that is plus 16. So when you add them, you get zero. And that's what appears here. So this is secretly zero for the 3450 model. Right. So so can I also go further? Like, what's the, the term that imply in the big bracket, square bracket? What what, what, what does this term, if it's uh -huh. what does it imply? And what if it's vanished? Oh, it implies the model is inconsistent. If if this if you choose charges here if you choose you know th these things in such a way that this doesn't vanish, 
then this is an inconsistency. This is a statement that you had some gauge redundancy that, you know, but it, it's not a redundancy. It, 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 like it's a, <laughs> it, you get an inconsistent model. You have a model with a gauge anomaly. So that's, it's, it would be very bad. And, and the, the little a here is a dynamical gauge field? Little a here is a dynamical gauge field. Um, and then the other objects, the M and the R and the lambda are, oh, let's see. So the M, let me try to remember. I think the, the yeah, good. A is a dynamical gauge field. R is its plaquette valued cousin. You know, the, the, in the Villain formation, they come in the package. Yeah. And then from my recollection is that M uh, and lambda are gauge parameters. Lambda is like a continuous gauge parameter, and M is a discrete gauge parameter implementing large gauge transformations for the U1 gauge field. And lambda is the low, like the small gauge transformations. And so, the, yeah, so, so basically the, the gauge variation of the action is not necessarily zero in general. So you get something involving gauge parameters, that's bad. But if you choose the charges correctly, that vanishes. Right. So that's just like in the continuum, of course. So two more comments. Uh, so one thing is like, there is possibility you can introduce another U1 chiral, right? Three four five zero is one. You can choose something like a. Uh, oh yeah, you, you, yeah. Five, that's right. Five, that's right. That's right. That's right. There, there are other U ones, and you could you could okay. turn gauge fields for them. Yes, absolutely. You can, you can turn on both chiral U1. I think maximally in this model. So that's I right. That's right. You, you can. Work. And another comment is that does that square bracket term imply a possibility to introduce a bulk or introduce Berman doubling somewhere? Oh, you're yeah. saying, good. Yeah, could, well, could, good, good. So I think could, indeed, if you, another way to cancel this yes. would be to introduce um, another sector with you know, some other charge assignments such that you cancel this by adding new degrees of freedom. You could think of that as doubling. So that's another way, but then that would like change the theory. Um, then you could ask, having done this change to the theory, can you gap out this other sector? That would be more like what the um, the mirror decoupling approach would, would be, or the symmetric maturation approach would be. Maybe one thing I want to say here is, um, uh, how do I put this? There's not like one thing that is the best by any means. So this approach, as, as we understand it so far, we only know how to do it for abelian theories. Whereas I think in the symmetric mass generation approach, there's not an obvious restriction to abelian chiral gauge theories. And in fact, I think there's papers that you, you've been involved in where you've thought about non-abelian chiral theories and so on. I have no idea how to use our approach for that. So it's very likely that there are um, com there's complementary strengths to, to the various approaches. Um, I think uh, there's a professor, Yoshio Kikukawa, in the audience. He also tried to work on this spin ten yeah. version of the model. Yeah. It's very nice. I think I think this this term might also be canceled by some type of transcendence theory version of that that you come in, in the end. I suppose if if that coefficient is non zero, I, I guess you can one can possibly also introduce a, a bulk or something. You, you, yeah, yeah, you, you probably can. You probably can, yeah. You probably can. I haven't thought about doing that, but you probably can. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, th thanks so much, Drew. Yeah, this has been great. Any questions and comments from people here? Please feel free. Uh, if that's... Thanks, Alexi, again, and turn off turn, turn up the recording. And if people want to ask questions, please feel free to stay. Thank you, Alexi. Thanks so much. Thank you.